Welcome everyone to the January Government Affairs Connection. My name is Deborah Nimi. I'm the chair of the Government Affairs Connection. We are so pleased to host this morning three senators and one representative. All have specific topics related to promoting and protecting the South Dakota business community. I will let Anna from Elevate, the public policy director, introduce them to you. We're so grateful to have these legislators on today, and we encourage everyone to take the opportunity to ask the questions on your mind related to the South Dakota legislature. If you have any questions throughout the presentation today, please submit your question in the Q&A box below at the bottom of your screen. With that, I'll turn it over to Anna. Thank you, Deborah. I so appreciate you being online this morning. I'm gonna do a quick introduction of our panel today. Um, first, we've got um, Representative Becky Drury from District 32, um, Senator Dave Johnson from District 33, Senator Mike Dietrich from District 34, and Senator Jessica Castleberry um, from District 35. So thank you to this great esteemed legislative panel that we have today. I know this is a busy time. And again, thank you to all of the audience members as well who have joined us this morning. Before I turn it over to our panel, which will take up the bulk of our time together this morning, um, I wanted to do a quick overview, kind of have a few minutes to talk about my role at Elevate and as a registered lobbyist. Um, and so with that, I am gonna share my screen so you're not looking at my face this whole time. So give me one moment. Great, so here are the few topics I'm gonna to touch on. Um, for the audience members online, lots of you are our loyal GAC webinar participants. And so I know a lot of you heard the overview done by uh, David Owen, who works for the South Dakota Chamber. He does a great overview each December. And so I don't wanna belabor a lot of the, um, the, the deep dive or the details of session, but I did wanna have a few points top of mind for our investors as we move into session that will start next week, that really did creep up. And so I wanna to touch on a few things. Um, firstly, as we all know, session commences next Tuesday, January 12th, and it starts with the governor's state of the state. And it's gonna run for 37 days through March 11th. Uh, 37 days was the same amount of time that the session ran last year in 2020. And for reference, in those 37 days last year, there were 480 pieces of legislation that were introduced. So that's a good, um, whatever, litmus test, whatever you'd wanna say for the amount of work that we'll be looking at this year. If any of you go, go on to the SDLRC website, which is that home base for all things legislature related, there are already 60 bills introduced. And so session has not even opened yet. So I know what I'll be doing this weekend, but starting to review those bills, that way we're all prepared moving into next Tuesday. Um, the last bit of overview I want to touch on, and this is specific to our region and something I'm really excited about, but our Black Hills area region, we have several members of our delegation that were elected into leadership positions. Um, and we've got um, at least one of those members online with us today. Um, Senator uh, Mike Dietrich will be the assistant majority leader. And then um, we, so we've got two other leadership positions in the Senate. We've got three in the House from the Black Hills area. And then we have Senator Dave Johnson online as well. And this is a quasi leadership position in my opinion, but he is an appropriator. And so we're gonna look to him a little bit later to talk about why that's important and why it's really um, an awesome opportunity to have regional uh, legislators that are on that appropriations committee. Next, I'm gonna turn it to, I guess turn it to myself um, to talk about all of the advocacy. I find when I talk about being a registered lobbyist, um, it, it sometimes has, a, you know, there's a, a look that you get where people make come some kind of noise uh, just to, to share that it's uh, one of those, those uh, roles that I think are very misunderstood. And so I want to make sure I talked with you all and to our investors, especially to talk about what it means to be a lobbyist. What are the strategies I employ to make sure that I'm effective and then talk about why it's important to have this resource out in peer. So firstly, um, and some of these legislators might disagree or might have their own opinions, but I have a few um, kind of strategies I think about and reflect on going into peer to make sure that I'm doing the best job that I can. And these are the strategies that um, you all as investors can trust that I am working on every day out there when I'm advocating for your interests. So first and foremost, be present. This goes 
hand in hand with the fact that I'm there full time. I'm there every day, um, starting in the morning. Um, 7 a.m. is usually the start of all the committee hearings, and you're there through session, which starts in the afternoon and through the evening when there are other committee meetings, other meetings, um, informational events, whatever it may be. Um, they're long days, but it's really important that you're present there. Not only should you be present, but you have to be active. You have to be an active listener. You have to not just show up to the committee met meetings. You have to be prepared. Take your notes. Know what they're talking about. Um, listen to the floor speeches. Go to those briefings. That's really important. Um, thirdly, be knowledgeable. Know your facts. Know what you're talking about. Be truthful. Um, this is one thing I'm really excited to touch on or at least expound upon during this legislative session because I have an arsenal of staff at Elevate that I didn't have access to last year with our economic development director and our workforce development director. Those are two key points um, that I talk about in peer often. It'll be really great to have uh, that subject, those subjects and those staff members online um, to offer those that, that data and, and that information for me to use and to inform our legislators. And then above all communication, um, there's so many different ways that we communicate with our legislators out there. Um, the emails, print material, texts, phone calls, meetings over lunch, offering to grab them coffee as they walk to their next committee meeting. Um, the most important part about that is just being ready to chat and have that really important um, talking point ready at all times, even if you just have three seconds with the legislator, it's really important. Lastly, what, so why is this important to have in peer? Why is this lobbyist resource so important? For one, I am one of a handful of lobbyists who are full-time in peer that come from the Black Hills region. Um, there are lots of lobbyists, there's hundreds of them, and, and most of them are either from Sioux Falls or, or live in peer. Um, so it's really important that we have that seat at the table as a region. Um, I represent Elevate's interests and only Elevate's interests. This isn't a bad thing, but lots of lobbyists have several different clients. They might have a badge clip that has 20 other organizations that they're working on bills um, or other initiatives. You all can trust that I am out there um, and, and legislators can trust us as well, representing just Elevate and just our interests, which I think goes a long way. Um, I provide a direct access to the process. Things move very quickly and I could not do this job effectively if I was doing it all remotely. Um, so that's an important piece. And then lastly, and most importantly, it builds trust and authority. Um, I ask a lot of our legislators across the state um, and the PPC is a big part of that in terms of establishing that authority, um, but it's important to have that skin in the game, um, to be there in the trenches as well, um, to support our legislators and let them know that we understand the process and that we're, we're doing the work with them as much as we can. So with that, I'm gonna pause and I'm gonna look to our panel and I'm gonna turn it over to you all. So I, I've submitted or I've talked to you all about some questions I'd love for you to talk about. Um, I'm gonna start with some introductions and I'm gonna kick it off to Representative Becky Drury to go ahead and start. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, hold on. Oh, good morning, everyone. The sun keeps moving on me, so let's try to block it out here a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I might have to go clear over here, sorry. Good morning. Thank you everyone for zooming in this morning. My name is Becky Drury. I am the representative newly elected from District 32. You may think I'm a familiar face as my term on the council. On the council, I chaired legal and finance. I vice chaired legal and finance and I served as vice president of the council on my term. I will be serving on taxation, military affairs, and local government, which I think are all good fits for my background. Again, I'm from District 32, which was also mostly part of Ward 1 and Rapid City, and I'm excited to be going to Pier. How long did I have, Anna? Nope, oh, that's perfect. Nope, thank you, Representative. Uh, Senator Johnson, are you ready to go? Oh, I think so. <laughs> uh, so, I've been in uh, peer as a legislator for four years. This is my fifth year, the beginning of my third term. First term as uh, 
a state senator. And as my first term as a legislator in the Appropriations Committee. So I have a lot of learning to do. And uh, I walk into this with my eyes wide open and my ears wide open, just trying to learn how the process of financing state government. That's, that's my function and that's my role. That's what I look forward to doing. I'm from District 33, which is Central Black Hills area. Most of the people on this uh, Zoom meeting are familiar with us. So I don't think any other introduction is necessary. I look forward to working with everybody here on this panel this morning. I know them well and I, I, you know, I'm excited. I think we have a real good opportunity here to get some creative and uh, beneficial aspects done for the state of South Dakota, especially with respect to tourism and economic development, West River. So thank you for the opportunity to come in today. Thank you, Senator. Um, I'm gonna look to Senator Mike Dietrich. Good morning, thank you. Thank you for having us here and pulling everybody together. And, and I appreciate your description of lobbyist and, there's so much more to that. You're never not working. You're always networking, even though it may seem like you're having casual conversations or you're you're chilling in the sitting in the in the uh, spectator seats or wherever you might be. There's a lot of work that goes on, and an important part of that too is other uh, people from our community, former legislators, uh, people who are on important committees. Uh, there's a lot of discussion that goes on, and, and there's a group of us, former legis legislators and retreads, that uh, get together and talk about issues that are coming up in a bipartisan way, and there's just all kinds of great progress that we can make, and these programs help facilitate that, so thank you. Did you, um, uh, Senator Dietrich, the committees that you were on, did you run through that? No. No, I didn't. I'm on uh, State Affairs Committee, uh, Judiciary Committee, and Local Government Committee, and then also on the Legislative Procedures Committee, which is the, the group of legislators that help put the rules together by which the legislature operates, the procedure occurs. Uh, we have ad hoc committees that come and go. Uh, the standing committees are, are the committees that we go to uh, two or three times a week. And so uh, judiciary covers a lot, of, a lot of stuff related to legal, um, domestic violence, uh, criminal, public uh, protection, public safety. Uh, state affairs covers a wide range of issues. Uh, a lot of them are somewhat politically charged, but they're a bigger policy type issue. And local government, I've been on that in the past, and that's, that's an interesting community because local government affects your daily lives. Thank you for that great descriptive. Uh, Wow, great description. Um, the committees that these legislators sit on often are indicative of their strengths, whatever their profession might be. So the committees that they're appointed to often dictates a lot of work or at least the subject matters that they will be working on throughout session. So thanks for that great description. All right, lastly, Senator Castleberry. Hi, Anna. Thank you so much for uh, hosting this today. I'm very happy to be here. I'm Senator Jessica Castleberry. I represent District 35, which is Rapid Valley, Box Elder, and Northeastern Rapid City. I am the Vice Chair for the Senate Military and Veterans Affairs Committee. I'm the Vice Chair for the Senate Transportation Committee, and then I also serve on the Taxation Committee. Great. Thank you. So to stay on time, I'm going to move right along and we're doing great on our timing. Um, we are going to transition to some topic discussion. And so for each of the legislators, again, I had mentioned that we had asked each one of them on for a rather specific region, uh, reason or specific niche topic that I thought they would be the most expert to talk about. So um, the first person I'm going to ask to, to join um, and answer some questions will be Senator Dietrich. Um, and I wanted to first talk about the role of leadership. I had mentioned in the beginning that you were going to be our assistant majority leader. So I'd love for you to talk about the impact of that leadership position and then specifically your position. Um, um, how does that impact session and, and the way that things go? Uh, th thank you for that opportunity. Uh, West Rivers really uh, has a significant number of legislators elected to leadership positions or uh, chairing committees or vice chairing committees. And so the 
that means that there's a, a greater opportunity for our constituents and our advocacy groups in our area to communicate with those leaders on issues that are important to them and to their communities. And so it's really, it's really a good thing. And I'm, I'm very proud of our group. Uh, today, I'll talk briefly about uh, leadership structure and selection, uh, the process, uh, duties and responsibilities of top leadership, and, and suggest how you can optimize the leadership for your advocacy. So first, each political party, and this is, this is a 101 uh, model, but it kind of follows, it flows after uh, what Anna had to say about lobbying, and then this is a part of the way of you help you lobby effectively. Uh, each political party elected to the legislature has its own caucus, and so right now in South Dakota, there are four caucuses, the majority and minority caucuses, uh, one each in the House and one each in the Senate. And then out of each caucus, the members elect its leaders from the membership. Each caucus meets daily to discuss important things, typically what's on the calendar or the agenda for the floor uh, meeting session, uh, what's going on in committee members, uh, committee meetings, uh, talk about um, issues that are important, it, that have important information just about generally how we fulfill and the information we need to fulfill our responsibilities as legislators. In South Dakota, the Constitution requires the lieutenant governor to preside over the daily sessions of the Senate. Uh, the lieutenant governor also has constitutional power to vote to break a tie in the Senate. Otherwise, our lieutenant governor is uh, primarily the parliamentarian and presides. That's a little different than in the House. So uh, then, so the next in the Senate, the leaders are the president pro tem. The president pro tem is really the person who uh, runs, uh, presides over the Senate, the calendar, the assignment of committees, that's uh, Senator Lee Schoenbeck. And he uh, presides over the session when the Lieutenant Governor is not available. And of course, the Lieutenant Governor has other duties uh, with the state and is not always present. Uh, the next leader is the Majority Leader, and then the Assistant Majority Leader, and then followed up by the whips. The group, uh, the, that total leadership group typically meets with the Governor, uh, the day before each week of session uh, to discuss what's going on in the session, what happened last week or what's, what we expect to happen during the next week or to advocate things. Uh, the top caucus leaders are the Senate President Pro Tem and the House Speaker. Uh, the Speaker uh, presides over the House daily sessions all the time and they have a Speaker Pro Tem, which is like a, um, a vice speaker, so to speak, uh, who presides when the speaker is not available or it has, it has opportunity to speak on a bill or present a bill. Uh, but the, basically the Senate pro tem, uh, President pro tem and the Speaker of the House have the main duties of appointing committee chairs, vice chairs, members in their respective chambers. And that's usually based on their expertise and experience. Uh, they refer bills to the committee after they're submitted by the members. They determine the daily calendar and the agenda, what's going to happen uh, they act primarily as the parliamentary over their respective chambers. And then importantly, they work with the other leaders, the other chamber and the governor's office to coordinate communications and, and process. So the best way to uh, optimize the leadership power of our communities is to establish a positive relationship with them. Uh, like you, like uh, Anna is a good example of that. I, and there are many members of our community that come and, and do that, especially on Chamber Day or Business Day, those, those events. Uh, but a, 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 a relationship of communication and mutual respect uh, really opens the door for our members to share information, to advocate and defend positions that are important to them and their businesses and their communities. And so as a, a, a advocate, Maybe even you may, someone may become a, a lobbyist, registered lobbyist, but it's really important to get a hold of your legislators and especially the leadership. And so call them up, uh, meet them for coffee, attend the Cracker Barrels, use the network and the connection that we have established in the in a Black Hills area. Use that to our advantage of putting South uh, West River's interest, making sure they're on the radar. And and one way that happened in for the last what nine, eight nine months, maybe longer. Um, the people that are on this call on this uh, web or Zoom, we all talk, got together and we talked about priorities. What are things that we need to do for our communities? We brought in legislators from the, the Northern Hills, from other areas of the Black Hills. And, and so the, the, the whole network works well. So optimize it by uh, using the people you know. So the 
assistant majority leader really basically assist is assist the majority leader in uh, managing the floor activity in helping determine the agenda and the uh, policy and the um, for the caucus and and we don't just create it we work with the whips we have communication with all the members we decide on the direction generally that the caucus is going to go uh, we do a lot of other administrative things. We help keep the whole session going. We make sure the communications are occurring. And then on uh, when there's a bill on the floor and it's, and it's uh, party politics, or if it's important one to our caucus, the majority leader is typically the first speaker, the primary speaker, and the assistant majority leader is either the second speaker or, or backs up the, the main speaker. And um, But most importantly, it's keeping the whips and the communication going so that we know what's going on at home and how we can help. I know I talk kind of fast, but I'm just it's so time, sorry. It's a lot of information and, and certainly a huge takeaway from that. And thank you for doing that deep dive for this um, 101 purpose. But for those of you on the call, um, if you have any leadership in your um, from your district, make sure you leverage that as an asset because that is a great um, direct line of communication for, for how things go and, and what um, you as a committee member want to prioritize. So just keep that in mind. Thank you, Senator. Um, next, I'm gonna ask you quickly, and this will be um, just as brief as you can, if you can do a recap of, of maybe last year's session, um, that's a big question, but mostly any of those uh, topics from last session that you see that might translate over to this session um, and, and might dictate some of the, the, the themes that we'll see starting next Tuesday. Well, those of you who watch uh, uh, the legislature every year and are engaged in it and participate in the process in whatever way it may be, uh, know that there's recurring issues. There's always the, the budget, the education funding, the uh, roads and bridges. Um, and then we have our uh, social uh, legislation that, that consumes a significant amount of time and resources too, like uh, transgender bills or other bills of that nature. And we have, we try to focus on economic development. So there's always something unresolved. I, I think our biggest challenge will be the amount of money that we have from the uh, relief funds and how that gets prioritized and spent. And that will raise a whole bunch of issues that we could not resolve in the past because of resources. And now we'll have to have a, we'll reconsider and determine what is possible and not everything's possible. But the other bills, they come back every year. Yeah, that's something very unique to these part-time sessions that most states have. So thank you for that overview. Dave is gonna be, I'm sorry, Senator Johnson will be one of those um, legislators that are in, in the trenches working on and all of the, the money issues that will be coming through that is very unique to this session of 2021. So we're not going to Senator Johnson yet, but thank you, Senator Dietrich, for your experience and your leadership. We're so grateful to have you in District 34 and thank you for joining us today. All right, so now I'm now gonna move to actually, Senator Johnson, you are next. Um, and this, um, is, it's a really great opportunity to have you online. Um, we had talked about your role as an appropriator, you had touched on it as well. Um, so I would love for you to just delve a little bit more into that. Um, what is an appropriator um, and how does this relate to um, the state budget? Well, thank you. And I wanted to point out also that uh, the lobbyists you mentioned that you're going to be representing Elevate out there, Anna, as a lobbyist for only Elevate, but there are a lot of lobbyists out there that carry around 20 different organizations, 20 different identification cards. But what I've found in the first four years is that the lobbyists are extremely critical to the legislative process because they represent uh, organizations and essentially the taxpayers and the issues that are important to those taxpayers. Elevate Rapid City is uh, concerned about tourism, economic development, West River. And then uh, you apparently work very, very closely with the South Dakota Chamber. And you talk about uh, economic development statewide. And the lobbyists have been very critical about getting information because lobbyists are able to focus on their specific issue which are legislatures, as you mentioned, there are already 60 bills that have been dropped. But typically we look at between 
350 and 500 bills. How can we possibly as legislators know as much about bill number 1056 as if that's your issue? How can we know as much about it as you do specifically? So we depend on the lobbyists to represent the taxpayers uh, when it comes to legislation. As far as the Appropriations Committee, this is my first year on the Appropriations Committee, as I mentioned earlier. Next week on Wednesday, the day after the Governor's State of the State Address, the, the Appropriations Committee will be undergoing what's called agency budget hearings. The government agencies, state government agencies will be presenting their agency budget requests to the Appropriations Committee. And what this is actually is a communications uh, ability for, for the agencies to go uh, represent what they want for their government agencies. It's actually a communication to the taxpayers of South Dakota through the Appropriations Committee. The Appropriations Committee will be hearing from these government agencies about what, what does the agency provide to the state of South Dakota and to the taxpayers, excuse me, and also what kind of successes has the agency had over the past year? What are some of the challenges and concerns that these government agencies have had over the past year? These will all be presented to the Appropriations Committee and the legislators that are on that committee. The, the Joint Committee on Appropriations will then, after all of the hearings are completed, which again, they begin Wednesday, the 13th of January, the appropriators then begin setting up the budget process by adopting a, a budget for each and every agency individually. The, Joint Committee on Appropriations then presents the entire state budget to the legislature as a whole in a, for, in, the, in a bill called the General Appropriations Act, also called the G-Bill. It's typically the very, very last thing that is ever discussed as, a, as legislators prior to veto day, which is at the end of March. So the process of being an, an appropriator is to listen to what the people of South Dakota want, how they want to spend their money that is generated by the state of South Dakota. The state of South Dakota has revenues typically, I had to look it up. Well, last year, the receipts for the state of South Dakota was 1.74 billion with a B. The expenditures of the state of South Dakota last year was 1.7 billion and so there was a little bit of excess this year but 60 percent of those receipts 60 percent of the revenue comes from sales tax and the other important thing to understand is that 75 percent of the receipts that come into the state of south dakota is spent in two areas uh, 520 million in health and human services and then another 47% or so, I'd, I'd have to look up the number, but goes to education and local government. And education meaning K through 12 and also the Board of Regents. So 75% of the, of the state of South Dakota's revenue goes to those two areas. So the, the remaining 25% is with the rest of the state of South Dakota and all of the government agencies. Government agencies are the people of South Dakota. They'll be presenting their requests for hearings that last, from what I understand, for two or three weeks. Each and every government agency will come before the appropriators and use the Appropriations Committee to talk to the taxpayers of South Dakota. That's something that's critical that people understand. I don't think people have really paid attention to the fact that when when we're going through the hearing process, that that is uh, the state of South Dakota, the taxpayers speaking to the legislature, and this is how they want their money spent. That's what I've learned so far and as an appropriator. And you said that uh, the session begins next Tuesday. Is that right? Is that what you said, Anna? Yep. Yeah. Where is that? Where, where will they be holding? I haven't heard. I'll have to look at my calendar to see when this 
What do you, never mind. I'll, I'll, I'll look at, I'll find, have to find out where they're having the legislature this year. I'll and send you a follow-up. Yeah, I'll, I'll call you up and I'll find out when they're having it and where it's going to be held this year. Thank you. Um, and well, on that point, and just as a quick follow up, uh, there was a lot of confusion and, and uncertainty leading up to even next Tuesday about the changes at the legislature with COVID. I mean, there's still a lot of questions I think we all have. Um, so I just quickly, um, and Senator, we, we're running a little bit uh, low on your, your section for time, but um, in terms of the budget, what's the situation with the CARES Act funding and what we're looking at for the budget process um, going into this session specifically? Well, this year has been described as a honeymoon year because <laughs> there's extra money to be spent. Now it's called coronavirus relief funds. You know, clearly some people are unhappy with the fact that there's all this money and it must be spent. There are other people who are giddy with joy that there is this much money that has to be spent. The bottom line is that there's anywhere from 150 to 230 million that I've heard of that's available uh, for spending that we don't normally have. These are one-time funds that are gonna be able to be spent on items such as School of Mines Mineral Industries Building, which is one of my favorites, of course. You know, we're looking at uh, spending some money on, on developing some on-campus facilities for the, the mining industry. Uh, there, there is, I, I would guess 30 or 40 different requests for this kind of money. Coronavirus relief funds, the CRF funds, there's a lot of extra money there this one year. Uh, we just have to, we have to spread it out across the state and spread it out evenly. Hopefully we can spread it out a little more unevenly in West River this year. That'll be my goal to get as much of it out here as possible. So I could go into some of the other specific items that we're looking at spending, but I believe the other legislators that are on board here have some items to discuss. As far as the COVID idea, you know, there are a lot of different ideas on how to process the legislature this year. I, I don't think anybody knows how it's going to go. Mm -hmm. I've already had some legislators who say they're not even going to attend in here because of coronavirus. I, it's a uh, it's open, it's unknown. We'll see, just have to see how it goes. I, th I think we'll be all right. I think our leadership, our assistant majority leader in the Senate, I think our house leadership, they'll, they've got it in hand. And I go out there expecting the leadership to, to let us know and to keep us safe. And frankly, I'm not worried about it. Thank you, Senator. I, I will be really interested to see if that honeymoon year title is still attached to this 2021 session by the end of it. Uh, we'll see how it goes. I agree. Well, Thank there you. are people, like I said, there are people who don't want to spend it. I understand that. There are people who do want to spend it. I understand that. Everybody's crunched for money. Do we spend it or do we not spend it? It's There's valid arguments on both sides of that extremely uh, hot issue this year and we'll just have to see how it goes we're really fortunate to have you in that position so thanks for all of your work and your leadership so i'm now going to turn it to um kind of our newer side of the the panelists that we have uh senator johnson and diedrich both have been around a while and are very familiar names um but i am going to turn it now to, to senator castleberry um and, and the first question i'd like to ask you senator um what is the biggest takeaway from your first year at the legislature. As we all know, you were appointed by the governor last year. And how does this impact your approach to, to this next session? Well, thank you so much for the question, uh, Anna. As you mentioned, I was appointed last year on December 31st, and I had uh, just about 14 days to get all of my affairs in order before session started. So uh, it's definitely been nice to get the experience this past year and to have a little more time to prep for session than what I was provided with last time. Uh, the biggest takeaway is really a recurring theme in our discussion here today. Uh, I was really uh, taken aback by the amount of bills that were presented. And I had been an advocate for many years and had been going out to peer uh, 
And I think it's one of those things where you have your laser focus on what your topic is that you're going there for. And I really, I had no idea that in a limited government state that we would have that number of bills brought and uh, just some food for thought that if every single one of those bills passed for the next 10 years, if we had that many new laws, I mean, it's, it's astronomical. Um, so for me, uh, you know, personally, taking a look at that uh, and how that influences how I approach the legislative session, I, of course, will be bringing a very limited number of bills. I believe in quality versus quantity, and I'm really hoping that uh, other legislators will keep in mind the amount of work that we have to do to make sure that South Dakota continues to thrive and that maybe they won't bring as many of those personal agenda bills, uh, although we already know that a lot of them are coming back. Um, but I would love to see a focus within our legislators on what we can do to continue to support our farmers and our ranchers, what we can be doing to support our small businesses, what we can be doing for workforce development. Um, so that's that that's where I'm at. I, you know, I have a couple of small things that I'm I'm going to bring, but uh, it's uh, it's interesting with a lot of those uh, really social issues where, especially now having gone through the election process, you can see how some of the strategy for certain politicians is to bring those really hot topic things that make the paper, they get their name out there, and then they use it uh, as ammunition during election time. And it's really for things that waste our time, they waste our money, they're unconstitutional. So that's something that uh, I think that people definitely need to be aware of, especially when we circle back for that election time again to hold your legislators accountable for uh, the way that they're representing your community. Thank you. I, I couldn't have said it better myself. And, and Senator, you, you came out strong your first year, and I think you've reflected a, a great grasp of your role um, at the state. And so we're really grateful for you. And myself specifically, I, you are my um, elected member. So I'm grateful to have you there. And, and as a constituent of yours, I'd love to ask um, for our business community, our investors that are online today, what is the best way um, for any of us to contact our elected member? Is it email, phone call? What do you all prefer and what is most effective? I think that's a great question, Anna, uh, because we, we a lot of times will hear from the same groups of people over and over again. And it's so valuable to have other input from various people throughout the community. And I think that may be different for every legislator, but the majority of us, I think, would say that email is a great way um, because that's something where we can respond to you at any time of day or night and those legislative days uh, can get really long so whereas you might not appreciate a call back at 11 o'clock at night we can definitely shoot an email uh, it's also just a great way to organize the information uh, i would encourage people that if you are sending an email to try to make them concise it's a lot easier for us to if, if you hit your three main points for us to be able to take a look at it include links to other resources so that when we have the opportunity we can dig into things a little further but uh you know we'll sometimes get emails that would be the equivalent of 10 printed pages and it's very difficult to get to the meat of what we need to know when we have to dig through that much information i would also caution uh, people from utilizing social media to contact us uh, I, just from a, an etiquette point of view and um, also just cleanliness of conversation. If you have questions, if you have comments, it's so much better handled in an email than in a random comment on a Facebook post. And I know that we can all be tempted to utilize the ease of access of there's a post right there and you post your comment, but I think it's also easier as a legislator to address uh, though, you know, any, anything, you know, po positive, negative uh, in the email format. And I know I, for one, I will always respond to you in a private message. Uh, you know, that's just a, that's just a policy that I have in that way with some of the things that we're struggling with, with social media uh, tending to become inflammatory, it curtails some of that and is more conducive to uh, actual 
quality communication with constituents. So, um, and I would also echo what Senator Dietrich said about relationship building. Uh, don't wait to figure out who your legislator is when you need something. Uh, it's really important to be informed and, and if at all possible to formulate that relationship with your legislator, reach out to them, tell them congratulations when they're elected or it, it just, as we know within business, the more that you build relationships with people, the, the, the easier it is to coordinate and to communicate rather than reading a headline and, uh, and then trying to get your point across when with a lot of those, we're getting 50 emails a day. And so if you can look at it and go, oh yeah, that's, I know who that is. They're, you know, they're from Elevate or they own such and such business in Rapid City. Okay, you know, how how is this going to affect us? Because it's just like has been covered here throughout this conversation. You are the experts in your own fields. You are the experts uh, within, how these issues are going to affect you and relationship building is just always best practice. That's great advice. Thank you. I think you gave a very holistic approach and several different options um, for contacting our legislators. And Anna, I'll add, oh, yep, Senator. Could I add a little bit to that on that issue of, no, you yep. don't have time? Well, if you can make it 30 seconds, oh, yes. 30 seconds, okay. I wanted to point out that, of course, not everybody can get out to peer, but that is by far the best way to get something done is to come to peer to talk to your legislator or to your committee member. And I know that's not possible, but people should remember that we've got an entire year. We've got two terms. You don't have to wait until the term, until the legislative body is in session. You know, contact your local legislator and go out and have coffee with them. I've had two dozen meetings in the last three months with constituents. And that is, you know, that's when their schedule is more open and, and we can actually have a one hour or an hour and a half conversation over coffee with a constituent. And I wanted to address the email issue. The problem that I have with emails is that I get so many formatted pre-written emails that I have a really hard time getting back to all of those. And I'm skeptical when it comes to content, people who say they're constituents who really aren't. So the email issue for me is not as effective parent, apparently as it is for Senator Castleberry, but if you can a phone call, a text, I mean, we've all got our phone numbers out there published on, on how to contact us, a text, to me says that a constituent has actually reached out personally to contact me and the texts will be responded to as it will be uh, voicemails, but emails are, are becoming polluted with pre-formatted from, from uh, political action committees. I don't like emails, but um, I certainly like phone calls from people in, in June and September and October. That's the way to get something done. Okay, for, for allowing, yep, Senator Dietrich. Excuse me, I feel like uh, I just want to throw, so we've talked a lot about the communication and how to work with the legislators and how the structure is. And so I just jotted down some of the things we're working on to, to help stimulate the thought. We're, the issues are going to be early childhood education, the B2 rate or impact on Box Elder, on our community, what can we do to support that? We already know about the Liberty Center, uh, the Crisis Stabilization Center in downtown Rapid City to help deal with the mental health stabilization in, in not only in Rapid City, but in South Dakota. We're talking about the School of Mines, Mineral Sciences Building, which is really needed for uh, School of Mines to build more engineers and to create more business and industry around here. Uh, the bioprocessing, which is a partnership between School of Mines and SDSU. And then on the business side, we've got workforce development. We need industry to be more, it, it continue the collaboration with tech to get projected jobs and to help develop the programs and skills needed for the future. And uh, I'm working on the uh, COVID liability limitation bill uh, for business and for healthcare. And so we've got a lot of uh, issues that are, are going to be exciting. And so those are the th some of the things that people on this call and other people may want to get a hold of us about. And now that you know how, contact us. Thank you. <laughs> 
Great. Okay. Well, thank you. That's such good information, especially for this audience. Um, and so I do want to look to um, Representative Elect Drury now um, and give her her piece as well. Thanks to everyone for all of their input on how to contact your legislator. Um, but I do want to look to Senator, uh, or I'm sorry, Representative Elect Drury now and ask you just a couple questions. Um, mostly, I think this is really important and a really um, cool part about um, kind of your background. Um, representative, but you served as a very effective city council member. And so you have some experience in that uh, political leadership, especially very locally. And I'd love to know, um, how do you feel like that's prepared you uh, for your first term in the legislature? Oh, and I'm sorry, you're going to be on mute right now. So. There. Thank you, Anna. On the city council, I served on legal and finance, I chaired that, I vice chaired that. And what those committees do are somewhat the same as we do in the legislature. You serve on a committee and you vote up or down on things that come before you and then you pass them on to the main floor or the main body. And those things are much like the bills that are going to be coming for us at the legislature we will have discussion on them, we will vote on them and send them forward or not send them forward. So that process is very, very much the same. I also served as vice chair of the council. So I'm used to being in a leadership position. I think some of the things I learned from city council that will carry me forward are we use parliamentary procedure at the council level, which you also do at the legislature. But the biggest thing I think is you're accountable for your vote. You have to do your homework. You have to ask the questions. And sometimes those questions are the questions no one else wants to ask because they might be uncomfortable, but you go ahead and do it anyway because you need to get to the crux and the heart of the matter. At the end of the day, when you walk out of your meeting or you walk out of the building, your fellow public servants, the staff, the mayor or the governor are not your enemies. You have to realize that you're not always going to vote the same, but that's okay because next time you might vote the same. So you have to walk out of there knowing that you did the very best you could for your city, your county and the state of South Dakota. And like I said before, there's times that you're not gonna going to vote together, but the next time you will, and you have to know that that's okay. And just hold your head high that knowing that what you did, that meeting that day was the best you could do. Are you always going to make the right vote? Probably not. We're gonna make wrong. We're all going to vote in a way that's going to upset some of the people some of the time and make the other part of the people happy part of the time. You're never going to please everyone. And I think that's the big takeaway knowing that you just cannot ever please everyone, but you do the best you can for your state. Well, thank you for that. I think you uh, certainly have uh, shown some proven leadership already and you're very well primed for an exciting first year. So we're fortunate to have you. Um, and quickly, what are you looking forward to uh, or excited about uh, for your first term? Well, the bills that are going to be coming before the legislature are much different than voting on um, public works on a road or on a city development. It's going to be much more broader. It, and of course, it's going to affect a broader spectrum of people. So I'm, I'm just looking forward to the variety of bills that are coming and are already coming. I'm just honored to be a servant for the people here. And I hope that they view me as a servant leader. And my prayer lately is this, that but when I get to be here, I just do the very best I can for the people of Rapid City, Pennington County, and South Dakota. And as I step into this new role, I am excited to be going there and I will do the very best I can. 
Great, thank you for, for everyone for responding to those questions and offering great insight on some pretty basic principles going into session. Um, I did wanna talk or at least open the floor for you all to discuss some of your priorities, but I might, I'm gonna push that to the end just so that we can address a few of the questions that have come through on our um, answer, uh, sorry, our question and answer session. Um, one, this is one that I don't think we need to address as a, as a panel. Um, there have been rules that were, um, or guidance that was uh, released yesterday. I believe it was yesterday morning about visiting the Capitol, what changes are happening um, due to COVID, where should you be wearing a mask, where is it only requested, whatever your questions might be, um, there is a document that the legislature has published. I will link that um, in our follow-up uh, information. That way, anyone that's hoping to go to the Capitol understands how they can do so safely and respectfully. So that will be coming, but that has been published and it can be find on, found on the SDLRC website. Um, this is a really important question. This comes from Tammy Hopp, um, the Black Hills, from the Black Hills Works Foundation. Um, and this has to do with the CARES Act funding. And so um, I'm gonna look to our appropriator to maybe um, take this question on, um, but can the CARES Act funds be invested or endowed with interest that have, or that peels over year after year? Is that an option? Oh, let's point out that the governor, in the governor's budget address um, one month ago, the governor has requested increasing the what we call the budget reserve or the rainy day fund from 10% to 12%. So that is one way that we can look at the CRF funds as going into, into the immediate future anyway. But we have to remember that this the CRF funds is what's called one-time money. It isn't going to be here next year. In fact, uh, like I said earlier, this year will be the honeymoon year. Next year, we're gonna pay the price for that honeymoon because we're gonna be short, substantially short on, on uh, budget and follow-up from this year where this 200, estimated 200 million is available. The answer is, for the most part, from what I understand is no, we can't put this money into a fund where we can generate income and interest to pay for ongoing expenses you know, with you know generally speaking the answer is no although the governor is trying to put some of that money away into a, essentially a savings account that we can access in following years great that's that's a perfect answer thank you for addressing that um we have another question that's coming in from representative elect mike derby who um we're all really excited to work with coming into next year and um his question has to do with some of the marijuana legislation that's um going to be brought um he's a part of something called the cannabis caucus in the house and it's made up of about 15 members with different interests um this will primarily be for educational and networking opportunities um for an organization like elevate for instance how can we interact with um the marijuana specifically that that uh that bill or that topic? How um, does this panel encourage uh, interest groups to have an opinion or talk to legislators about this issue? And that's gonna be an open question for, for anyone on this panel that might wanna address that. Is anyone else, I don't know who the members of the Cannabis Caucus might be. So if there's anyone else that might be a member of that. Well, I'm, I'm just glad to say that I'm not a member of the Cannabis <laughs> Caucus. <laughs> but yeah. uh, no, I, so, no, I, Representative Elect Derby is, is extremely familiar with the questions that the legislature is going to have to answer. I imagine you will have him on future government affairs committee Zooms. And so I look forward to listening when he's one of your panelists because he's, He's uh, clearly the expert on that on that uh, caucus, that sub caucus. I don't know who else is on it. So I'm not on that caucus, but I think it will perform an important um, information source and guidance as the legislature has to navigate through that those the initiated measures in the constitutional amendment and uh, the the cannabis caucus is is. Uh, 
as far near as I could tell, neither pro nor con. Um, it's just addressing all of the issues that come in and how to how is it properly regulated? How is it properly? What have other states done? What are learnings from other states? And so I think they'll serve a, a real a, a good purpose. The other Thank thing you. that I bring up, Anna, is I've had constituents approach me about it. I'm not part of the caucus either, but. Um, just from a purely economic standpoint, a business standpoint, as being a new opportunity for them to develop a new business. And I guess that's how people have been approaching me, is wondering how it's all, all going to shake down so they can have a new business opportunity. Those are all great insights. I know for an organization like ours, it, it, uh, Representative, your, your point's exactly correct. There's a lot of opportunity, and, but also still confusion and, and um, uncertainty about how this will pan out specifically. But um, to our investors who might have an interest in this, we plan to have a focus group to talk about either your questions or um, your feedback, whatever you anticipate could be helpful or detrimental in terms of the legislation that could come through. So um, keep an eye out for that. Uh, it'll be one of those big topics that's going to probably take up a lot of air at the legislature over the next three months. So um, to Representative Elect Derby, we're really fortunate to have you on that caucus. I think everyone can agree that we need great leadership there and a lot of experience. So we're looking forward to, to hearing your expertise on that topic um, as that comes forward. So um, I'm talking quickly now, but I'd like to, I'm going to pivot a bit from our set out agenda. I'm going to mention a few of the Elevate resources that we have, um, that we'll have on our website and send out for our investors. And then I'm going to open it up to each of you for one minute to talk bullet point format of a few of the bills that you might be bringing. Try and keep the context to a minimum. There'll be lots of opportunities to talk about these at our Cracker Barrel. So just a, a bullet point format for our last few minutes, and then we'll kick it to Deborah to close out our webinar. So quickly, um, Elevate will have several resources. We have our 2021 public policy guide that we'll be publishing shortly, and that will be um, an online resource that will, will, that will um, showcase the issues we're looking at, our policy statements. It's been really great to work with our PPC this year for a really, I think, significant and impactful public policy guide. Um, I will be continuing the GAC um, newsletter weekly. It's gonna be that same format as the BizLink that some of you are familiar with. So I'll be doing weekly updates um, from the Capitol each week and there'll be an opt-in email list for you all to um, sign up for if you'd like to receive those. Um, Linda Lee Viken, who's a great member of our PPC and another one of those seasoned um, and, of course, uh, brilliant and, and involved um, members, former members of the legislature, um, she has drafted a, an LRC guiding document, a really awesome resource for investors that might be wanting to navigate the website, wondering how to make the most out of all the tools on there. That will be something we'll distribute as well. So thank you to Linda Lee Viken for putting that together for us. I mentioned the Cracker Barrels. We will be hosting those this year. Keep an eye out for a press release. Those will be on January 30th, um, February 20th, February 27th, and March 6th. So keep an eye out for those details. There will be a live stream option and um, a limited audience option as well. So keep an eye out for those um, details. And then I'll also send out my um, contact information as well for anyone that's wanting to have a conversation with me about any questions or something they want to work on um, together during session from a business perspective or economic development perspective. So with that, um, there's a limited amount of time left. So again, I'll, I'll, I do want you all to have a chance to just mention a few of the topics you're excited to work on. Um, I'm going to look to Representative Drury first. Again, keep it very concise if possible. We only have a few minutes left. Thank you. Well, how's, how's this? I have no bills I'm carrying forward. I agree with Senator Castleberry that maybe less is more. And it also keeps our government limited by having, let's have less government. So I don't have any bills. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Thank you for being online. We really appreciate you. Um, Senator Johnson. Thank you. I I, I don't have a lot of bills. I do want to point out that it takes a bill to reduce the amount of South Dakota state statute that is on the books. Uh, you know, my first four years, I worked hard for three years and used three bills to eliminate more than 60 South Dakota statute on the books. So when you hear about the 350 to 450 bills, that doesn't mean new laws. Many of those are, are restrictive 
and actually eliminating South Dakota statutes. So keep that in mind. Mineral Industries building on the School of Mines campus is huge. The South Dakota Constitution requires a Mineral Industries uh, college education format for the state of South Dakota. School of Mines is one of the fewest, uh, one of the very, very few organizations in the entire United States that offers a degree in mining engineering. So the Mineral Industries building is the top of my list as far as getting uh, funding for, for that building. The Liberty Center out in Box Elder uh, is, uh, is a, a way to enhance the uh, military lifestyle of our, our uniformed men and women out, out at Ellsworth. There is a bill pending to get two legislators onto the South Dakota Ellsworth Development Authority as non-voting members. I think that's critical to have legislators on that board. And then, of course, I have always uh, been an advocate of our airport uh, infrastructure. And, the, and what we're going to try to do this year is encourage airlines to come back to Rapid City that lost, you know, we lost routes because of COVID. We're trying to build that back up too. So thank you, Senator. Tourism. Yep, great points. I appreciate that very high overview of those important topics. Senator Dietrich, I'm sorry, I'm popping around. Senator Dietrich, you're on mute. Perfect time to delay when time is short. Can we uh, keep him on mute? Can we just keep him there? I'm going to keep you on mute at this point. <laughs> <laughs> we need, you know, what, my focus and what, what is important to us is, is supporting School of Mines, supporting Ellsworth, supporting education, and supporting our business with the infrastructure, workforce development, uh, the uh, accessible housing, and the li liability from COVID protection. Great. Thank you, Senator. And then lastly, Senator Castleberry. Well, I definitely um, agree with Senator Johnson uh, with the cleanup bills. That is that those are the bills also. You know, we had one last year that had to do with uh, no longer requiring microfilming uh, of, of, of data. So uh, one of the bills that I'm bringing is a little bit of a cleanup bill and it streamlines some of the processes for auto auctions. Um, so that's something that I think that will be helpful and useful. A couple of the other things that I'm looking at are examining some of the changes that we made to education requirements due to COVID and seeing how many of those need to be re-implemented or are these ways that we can uh, simplify some of the things that are, some of the requirements that K-12 has. Uh, so that's on the list. And then also um, there's a lot going on in Box Elder with preparing for the B21s. There's a regional transportation improvement project that they need to do. There's capacity improvements for their sewer infrastructure. There's critical facility upgrades. We really need to take a look at Highway 1416. Uh, it's a really dangerous road and it it, we just have to redo that road. So that's uh, a few of the things that uh, are some of my priorities and then uh, also have been coordinating quite a bit with the Cornerstone Rescue Mission and various other community leaders to see what we can do at the state level to address some of the challenges that our community is facing with our with homelessness and seeing what we can do to increase capacity and increase resources. Thank you, Senator. Thank you to all of our legislators. That was a marathon discussion. I'm now going to look to Deborah Navy to close us out so we can to finish our webinar. Okay, thank you, Anna. And if you are watching this and you have questions, please get a hold of Anna at Elevate Rapid City. This concludes the January Government Affairs Connection. We want to thank the senators and the representative for spending your morning with us. Keep an eye out for our next Government Affairs Connection event it will be on Thursday, February 4th. Registration details will be in the Government Affairs Connection newsletter published right around January 19th, I believe, 18th, 19th. We hope you have an update for when these meetings can resume. We hope to have an update for you when these meetings resume in person. For now, we appreciate that you join us online over Zoom. 
And that's it for today. Thank you and see you on February 4th.